Miata is always the answer, an unofficial acronym that has long been affectionately shared by fans of the Japanese roadster all over the world. The idea being that whether you're looking for fun, adventure, reliability or usability, the Mazda MX-5 Miata is a car that can do it all. But is there any truth whatsoever to this claim? Well, that's me, Graham. That's my brother, Richard. That's our Mazda MX-5 NA. And we're off on a four day journey around Ireland and Northern Ireland to find out just that. Our journey began on a Thursday evening in Leicester, in the very centre of England. So to Ireland, we're taking this, the Mazda MX-5 Miata Mark I, or to us anoraks, the NA. Or, I guess if we want to be very, very specific, a Yunos Roadster, because this car a few years ago was actually imported from Japan. Now, this car has the V Special package, which gives it a whole host of lovely optional extras standard Mazda MX-5s don't get, including these very, very nice tan leather seats, which match the rest of the interior, including the tan carpet and various other lovely tan... Plastics. Plastics around the cabin, <laughs> yes, indeed. No, to be fair, it is lovely. You've got this wooden Nardi steering wheel, a Nardi gear knob and matching wooden handbrake lever handle. Yes. Uh, which makes the interior look really lovely. And outside you've got British racing green paint or neo green as Mazda call it and a matching um, tan soft top. You do. It gives the whole car a lovely kind of old school English vibe, which I think is what they're aiming for. After all, that is what the car was very much inspired by. And we've done a slight modification, which I think has enhanced the British racing car look, which is uh, by swapping the standard Daisy alloys to some 14 inch BBS alloys that came off the Mazda MX-5 S Limited version. Quite right, yes. Under the hood though, this car is completely stock. So they came with either a 1.6 or 1.8 litre unit. This car has the 1.6 litre power plant, which puts out around about 114 to 115 brake horsepower, something like that. The 1.8 is slightly more powerful. However, it also is said to be slightly less free revving than the 1.6 due to the smaller car having a slightly lighter flywheel. I'm pretty sure it's probably six of one and half a dozen of the other in terms of pros and cons. Now, my car, cost me £3,300 a few years ago and in recent weeks I've just given it a whopping big service including a new timing belt, a new water pump, new auxiliary belts, new seals all over the engine. This car should be in rude health and the pinnacle of reliability. Well, we will see. We will see. <laughs> Reliability is one of the great aspects of the Mazda MX-5. As we joined the motorway for a 120 mile drive through thick traffic up to Liverpool, we had no doubts or concerns as to whether the car would break down and leave us stranded or start overheating in standstill traffic. It's a car you can truly rely on to get you from A to B. Well, I said A to B. What I should have said is A to D. A2, D ferry terminal. We made it. Right, now we need to board. All right, here we go. How long's the journey? I think it's like nine hours or something like that. Oh, nice, so decent amount of sleep in the cabin. Yeah, I'm psyched for the cabin. I'm glad we got the cabin. I think uh, before we go to the cabin though, uh, a cheeky Guinness on board. Yeah, well, it's like, I think we've got to cover 150 miles on the ferry. I think we've got time for a couple. Sweet, well, first Guinness of the uh, trip then. Let's do it, yes. Look at our room. It's a palace. It's all right, actually. Look, it's got just little bunk beds, Whoa. should you need. So you're going to spend four hours on here and four hours on here after you've wet the bed on the top <laughs> one. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. We're not in Ireland yet! We're, We're in Ireland! Ireland! 
We were off the ferry and in Belfast, the capital city of Northern Ireland and the first stop on our trip. It's a place famous for all sorts, including being the build place of the Titanic and the shooting location for much of Game of Thrones. Yet, we weren't there for the tourist attractions. In fact, we had come to Belfast to tell a story about a car that is famously considered to be from the other side of the world. Allow me to explain. Initially, it does seem odd. We've come to Northern Ireland, a place rich with its own history. And yet the first story I'm gonna tell is one about an American car founded by an American man, made famous by American movies and sold exclusively to an American market. And yet the DMC DeLorean very much has its story here in Northern Ireland too. And it's a story about how a car brought hope to a community at a time when hope was hard to come by. Let me start from the very beginning. John DeLorean was the perfect cocktail of talent, charisma and cunning. Born in Detroit, the home of the US auto industry, to a father who worked at Ford, it could be said that young John was fated to work with cars. And so, as expected, he did. What wasn't foreseen, however, is just how good he would be at it. After brief stints working for Chrysler and the Packard Motor Company, DeLorean took up a position working for General Motors. During his tenure at the company, he went from strength to strength. His most notable achievement was his contribution to the birth of the world-renowned American muscle car in 1964 with the Pontiac GTO. To some, the GTO is the first ever muscle car. To others, that accolade belongs to the 1949 Oldsmobile Rocket 88 or the 1955 Chrysler C300 that preceded it. Regardless of whether it was the first or third of its kind, DeLorean's creation helped pave his way to the very top of General Motors. However, in 1973, after working at General Motors for 16 years, John DeLorean, who had always been seen as a bit of a colourful renegade at the otherwise stuffy organisation, was packing up to leave the motor giant. He felt the cars the company was producing were getting too stodgy, too sensible, too bland. DeLorean wanted to make a car that made people's eyes light up when they saw it, and he realised the only way to make his vision into a reality was to go about it himself without the constraints of a global corporation. When 1975 arrived, John DeLorean took the leap that would define his life. He formed the DeLorean Motor Company, known widely as the DMC. Mr. DeLorean's first port of call was to hire a designer, so he went to one of the best, Giorgetto Giugiaro. Giorgetto had designed Ferraris, Maseratis, Alfa Romeos, Lotuses and more beautiful cars. And he was given near enough free reign to pen a new car of similar stylish qualities to what had made his previous projects so popular. Hiring Mr. Giugiaro essentially was a way of DeLorean ensuring the car he was creating was going to be of striking design. After all, being able to produce a car that would make people stop and stare was one of the reasons John DeLorean left GM in the first place. The problem is, when aesthetics are given the utmost priority, sometimes developing a car from an engineering perspective can be tricky. So DeLorean's next task was to find someone who was able to turn what was essentially a beautiful sculpture on wheels into a usable, reliable and dynamic car. He contacted Porsche and BMW, but they wanted more money than the US startup could afford and told John DeLorean they would need seven and four years respectively to engineer his car. That was far more years than the promise DeLorean had made to have the car completed and in production for. What John DeLorean needed was not some state-of-the-art, rule-obeying, perfectionist engineering company. He needed to find someone like himself, a renegade with a taste for taking on the near impossible. And he found that renegade. A renegade who knew a little bit about engineering special, 
low volume sports cars. A rebel who had in fact set up his own sports car company a few decades earlier. This cunning nonconformist was called Colin Chapman and his company was called Lotus. So Lotus agreed to engineer the DMC DeLorean. Initially, the Norfolk-based car company was hesitant to help produce the already notorious American car as they feared it would be in direct competition with their recently released Esprit model. In the end though, once a contract had been agreed, the Esprit proved to be a very useful asset to Lotus's development of the DeLorean, with much of the chassis design and technology being transferred from the English car to the American effort. I'll go into the design and engineering of the DeLorean a little later, but for now, all I need to say about it is that it wasn't easy. Development was scheduled to take 18 months, however due to significant changes being made and the sheer complexity and size of the project, the car wasn't deemed production ready until 25 months after the development began. But when it finally was ready, another question awaited John DeLorean. Where was he going to build the car? Fortunately, this wasn't going to be such a challenge, as by the time he was ready to find a production facility, he and his upcoming car were already getting the nod to be the next big exciting thing, and countries were clamouring to host the DeLorean factory and enjoy the jobs it was undoubtedly going to bring to their local communities. Production was very nearly set up in Puerto Rico, however, in the end, John DeLorean struck a deal with the British government in which he received millions of pounds in grants and loans in order to build a brand new factory in the working town of Dunmurray, just outside of Belfast in Northern Ireland. Right, let's head there now. <laughs> Push the star. <laughs> the heart of Dunmurray isn't a place of exquisite beauty or high fashion shops. You won't find A list celebrities or business tycoons living here, and it's about as far from the glitz, glamour, and overt wealth of the Beverly Hills where John DeLorean called home as a place can be. But the Dunmurray of today is starkly different to how it was 40 years ago. In the late 1970s, recession had ripped its way through the world, arguably affecting Northern Ireland the worst, where unemployment had grown by around 300%. In addition to this, a war throughout Northern Ireland had been raging for over a decade between Unionists, who wanted Northern Ireland to remain with the United Kingdom, and Nationalists, who wanted Northern Ireland to leave the UK and join with the Republic of Ireland instead. It was a bloody and violent time, and those in Dunmurray, which was very much hit by the heartache of war, had little to hope for. But then, something happened. Diggers, cranes and construction crews started turning up in the fruitless town. Something was happening. Something was being built. What was being built? Well, it was this. The DMC DeLorean Factory an enormous state-of-the-art facility that promised to bring not only jobs, but also to add a new, bright page to Dunmurray's recently dark history books. The factory even had its very own test track, with an impressive banked curve in order for each car to be tested after production before being sent off to America for sale. As was envisioned, the factory was state of the art. But what couldn't have possibly been expected was the passion and sheer determination the factory workers of Dunmurray would exhibit in order to turn this far-fetched car into a reality. The factory was finally completed in 1980, and soon after, around 1,000 local workers were employed by the DeLorean Motor Company. To some, it was the first job they had been offered in years. 
DeLorean cast a wide net in their search for employees, and due to that, they had what could have been a troublesome cocktail of people on their payroll. Both unionists and nationalists, who had been fiercely at war for over 10 years, were to be working side by side on the DeLorean, at a time when tensions were as high as they had ever been. So, what happened on that first Monday morning of work? Good things happened, that's what. New employees turned up at the Dunmurray site. Men and women who were politically at odds with one another. People whose houses were literally separated by 18 foot high walls in order to minimalise the chance of violence between communities. They waited for the doors at the DeLorean factory to open together. Then walked into the factory together and then took on their role in producing a car that promised a brighter, safer future, together. In a country that was experiencing such divide, turmoil and trouble, the DeLorean factory in Dunmurray was an oasis where everyone was united in undertaking a single task. Mind you, undertaking said task wasn't easy. Building a car in a somewhat war zone is a difficult and dangerous business, and the resolve of the DeLorean Dunmurray workers was put to the test. Every day would prove a difficulty for the workers to travel to the Dunmurray plant. Recent uprises and protests would render the roads blocked by demonstrators or the armed forces. Those travelling to work would have to navigate a maze of Belfast's back roads in order to avoid the violence. A maze that could be entirely different in the evening than it was in the morning, depending on the day's goings on. Yet still, the workers would arrive. During a particularly fierce riot happening just down the road from the factory, the British army, who were opposing the protest, inadvertently directed the angry mob towards the DeLorean plant. During the madness of this demonstration, a homemade firebomb was thrown over the factory fence, hitting the building and burning years worth of records. It's said that even the original engineering drawings for the car were destroyed in the incident. Workers were in tears, sifting through the burnt remains of their hard work. However, still, they remained resolute. They painstakingly rewrote, redrew and reorganised the vast numbers of destroyed records, without faltering. Over the course of a single month in 1981, there were 10 firebomb attacks on or around the DeLorean factory damaging not only factory property, but also destroying the cars of local workers too. Those who worked on desks near to windows were advised by seniors to ensure they were facing the windows rather than having their backs towards the outside, so that they would be able to see if a firebomb was being thrown their way. And yet, regardless, workers would arrive in order to contribute to building the DeLorean. Then, the army moved in. In an attempt to help protect the factory, the British forces took up residence in the DeLorean factory. The on-site personnel training building was turned into a barracks, and it was actually recorded that people would be working at their desks with an armed soldier beside them, pointing a rifle outside of their office window. It was as if the DeLorean, this luxury, glamorous car of the future, was being built not in a brand new, state-of-the-art facility, but in the trenches of a war zone. And those building the car would have to fight every day just to make it to the trenches and do their part. The car was a responsibility for the Dunmurray workers to complete the task they had been set. To deliver the cars America was clamouring for, and to show the world that Belfast could make the headlines for good reasons. And they did. Even with the army involvement, the burning of engineering drawings, occasional evacuations due to bomb threats, and having to plan production around the riots as part of the car body building line had to be shut on protest days, the DMC DeLoreans were being produced. And what's more, 
they were getting better and better as the workers continued to gel together and dedicate themselves to producing the best cars they possibly could. Despite the turmoil surrounding the factory, things really were going from strength to strength at the DMC. From the first car leaving the production line in January of 1981, it took just six months to make the next 999. Employee numbers at the factory had risen to 2,600 people too, boosting the local Belfast economy. The production car was even first unveiled to the world at the Ulster Motor Show in Belfast in 1981, accompanied with Mr. Superstar John DeLorean himself, shining that light of positivity on Northern Ireland. It was looking like the car may be the saviour Belfast and Dunmurray so desperately needed. Sadly, this saviour was just too fragile to be sustained. In the winter of 1981, a recession hit America, the only market in which the DeLorean was offered for sale. Cars of any make or model were failing to sell, but for the DMC, who had by this point run out of money and were unable to secure any more loans, the inability to shift any of their $25,000 luxury cars proved fatal. As a result, in January of 1982, just one year after the first car was rolled off the production line, 1,100 DeLorean workers were laid off after the company had overstretched itself and was unable to cover the costs of paying them. Less than a month later, the company was forced into receivership, as those who had given loans to the DeLorean Motor Company concluded that they were not going to be receiving their money back, and therefore wanted to begin selling DMC property in order to receive their financial compensation. After further layoffs, the company was kept technically alive for several months, operating with a skeleton crew of just 20 to 30 people. Production on the cars finished in December of 1982, and to squash any chance of a fairy tale finale, the DMC DeLorean factory in Dunmurray permanently closed the same month, on Christmas Eve no less. For two years, the men and women of Dunmurray had been allowed to dream, to hope, that on the other side of the trials and tribulation of civil war was the possibility of prosperity. Over the 23 months they dedicated to the DeLorean, the workers of Dunmurray produced approximately 9,200 of the fabled cars. These 9,200 cars were dreamt in America, drawn in Italy, engineered in England, and manufactured in Northern Ireland. They went from being an idea to becoming a reality by hook or by crook, and they since have become one of the all-time automotive icons. And on their way, those DeLoreans have done a lot of good. But the question remains, is the DMC DeLorean a good car? Well, that's a question with many different answers. Yet, let's go and find one, and try and form an opinion. Right. Let's start with the exterior of the DMC DeLorean. After all, that's where the DMC started as well. The most famous and unique feature of this car is its brushed stainless steel body. This stainless steel skin isn't here purely for flair though. Actually, it's one of the first things John DeLorean insisted the car be built with. You see, he wanted the DeLorean to be a car of the future. But in order to be a car of the future, you have got to reach the future. Therefore, it was vital that the bodywork of the DeLorean be impervious to the plight of rust. And so, stainless steel was the solution. And it's what has given the DeLorean its famous and recognisable look. In part because it was only available in the colour stainless steel silver. The stainless steel body though, did give the DeLorean another peculiarity. You see, the DeLorean doesn't really actually have a stainless steel body. You see, at the very base of the car, it's got a standard steel chassis, much like what you'd find on the Lotus Esprit, as we discussed earlier. Then it has a fiberglass underbody, which gives the DeLorean its form and rigidity. And then on top of all of that are these stainless steel body panels, which are kind of just bolted on, really. So 
let's say the DeLorean was a house. The chassis would be the foundations. The fiberglass would be the bricks and mortar and would, you know, be the building of the house. And then the stainless steel would sort of be the wallpaper, I guess. There to tart the place up and make it look a bit awesome, which it does. Right, let's move on to the doors. They caused a lot of consternation between Lotus and the DMC. You see, John DeLorean insisted his car have three things before he sent it off to Hethel for engineering. It must have a stainless steel body, check. It must have a rear mounted engine, we'll get to that in a minute. And it must have gull wing doors. So, it does. Lotus hated them though, because they took away a whole load of structural rigidity from the DeLorean and reduced the handling potential of the whole car, because you've got these enormous gaps here in the side of the body. Here's what I mean. The Mercedes 300 SL is perhaps the most famous gullwinged doored car in the world. But the gullwing doors on the Mercedes are there because the chassis comes so high up the side of the car that the drivers wouldn't be able to get in and out of the 300 SL with regular doors. So the added height of the chassis down low more than makes up for the loss of rigidity at the top of the car. And the whole door gap in the car isn't that big. On the DeLorean, however, the chassis of the car doesn't come up high at all. In fact, the door gap starts so low, extends all the way up past where a regular door would end, and then eats in to around 40% of the roof as well. What this results in is a car that is far more twisty than it needed to be. When John DeLorean was pressed as to why gullwing doors were a necessity, he said, because the DMC is a new company, it needed to have stuff that was special, that would make it stand out. So these gullwing doors aren't here for safety or for extra performance. They're there just because they make the car look cool. These special and complex attributes on the DeLorean did cause some issues though, in particular in manufacturing and materials quality. You see, the factory workforce in Dunmurray wasn't comprised of experienced car builders. In fact, for many of the folk working on the DeLorean, it was one of the first jobs they had managed to get in their life. So initially, quality control was a nightmare. Gaps between the stainless steel panels were wide and uneven. It said the plastic door handles and electronic windows had a near 100% failure rate. And in fact, due to a quality control catastrophe, the first noted car off the DeLorean production line wasn't actually the first. That's because the first car was driven off the production line by a Lotus employee, out of the factory doors, and promptly crashed within seconds of its completion as the result of an apparent brake failure. Apparently, DMC had to spend approximately two and a half million dollars, essentially taking apart and rebuilding the first 400 DeLoreans they had produced in order to make sure they are actually safe to be sold and be driven. These issues were ironed out though, which was great because it meant that owners of the DeLorean could spend less time fixing their car and more time enjoying their car. And one aspect of the DeLorean, which is absolutely enjoyable, is the interior. The first thing you notice when you're in the DeLorean is it's a wonderful place to be. It feels wide, it feels spacious. However, it's maybe not as spacious as I expected it to be. You see, when I was reading literature on the car, I was reading how John DeLorean made a huge deal about the fact that it's so comfortable and spacious for him. He was six foot four and he always made a big deal about how he, you know, he had loads of headroom and he was always very, very comfortable in the car. But the fact of the matter is, there's not very much headroom in this car whatsoever. There's loads and loads of leg room. But if you are above six foot or so, I reckon you might be driving with a bit of a crick in your neck. Perhaps John DeLorean had really, really long legs and no vertebrae. I don't know, maybe. You've also got tons and tons of luggage space behind you, which is a really good thing because the boot, which is in the front of the car, is fairly shallow and the bonnet is front hinged, meaning that if you're trying to get a heavy suitcase or something into the boot, it is quite a strain. The interior finish is lovely. 
The seats, which are finished in this sumptuous gray leather, are incredibly comfortable. The whole interior is easy on the eyes. It's luxuriously minimalist. And dare I say, if Tesla were making cars in the 1980s, this is what the inside of them would have looked like. It's not all serious and sleek in here though. In fact, there's one very, very cool thing which I just really want to share. It's this little DeLorean door open warning light, which suitably is in the shape of a DeLorean with a gold wing door open. It's just there to let you know that your door is open and looks awesome being so too. It's a good thing the DeLorean looks so awesome when it stood still because it's not a car made for going fast in. The car uses a three litre V6 engine that you'll find on various Renaults and Peugeots and Volvos of the era. In fact, you'll also find it on the Argyle Turbo GT, which is the car we explored when we were filming in Scotland last year. Unlike the Argyle Turbo GT though, the DeLorean is naturally aspirated and puts out a rather modest 130 brake horsepower and approximately 150 pound feet of torque. What this all means is that zero to 60 miles per hour in the DeLorean took a somewhat sluggish nine to 10 seconds. That's around three seconds slower than the Porsche 911 of the time, which was a cheaper alternative to this car. The DMC realized that performance was an issue and actually set about making a twin turbo variant of the DeLorean, which would have vastly improved performance and put it in line with its competitors. Unfortunately, the company folded before that vision could become a reality. So naturally aspirated it remained, mounted at the rear of the car upon John DeLorean's insistence, apparently because he considered it of vital importance that a set of golf clubs could be fitted in the rear of the car across the rear parcel shelf. It also was likely because the V6 engine wouldn't fit in a mid-engine setup, which is where it was originally planned to be and was in early prototypes. What this rear-mounted engine resulted in was a 3862 front-to-rear weight distribution and some pretty unbalanced handling characteristics. With that all being said, general consensus on the DeLorean's handling is that it's good, especially so considering the rather lewd layout of features on the car. Whilst heavier than it needs to be, in large due to those decorative steel panels lining the body of the car, the DeLorean still weighs in at a not so lardy 1,250 kilograms at the curb. That's around 2,755 pounds and means the car still feels fairly nimble. And although the body twists more than it needs to, Lotus did a sterling job engineering the car, adding their signature charm and making the DeLorean at least relatively chuckable and fun around the corners. And while the engine does hang right at the back of the car, it's so underpowered you're likely not going to be going fast enough to actually need a hyper stiff chassis and perfect weight distribution anyway. The DeLorean isn't a sports car, I don't believe it was intended to be one but it's not quite a continent-crushing GT car either, primarily due to its measly 130 brake horsepower and lack of power steering. Instead, the DeLorean sits between the categories of cars, in this little grey area, a car that doesn't really make sense. It isn't the best at anything, it's probably more trouble than it's worth, yet is inexplicably loved by all. My theory is that this isn't just because the DeLorean hit Hollywood in a film or the high profile scandal that surrounded its founder, and it certainly isn't because it's a great car. The DeLorean is a good car, just about. But the story of its production, a story that showed how a car can be so much more than the sum of its parts, a story that showed how a car can bring camaraderie, unity, and hope to a community of people being torn apart by war. A story that showed just how resilient mankind can be when we share the same goal. In my eyes, that is what makes the DMC DeLorean truly wonderful and truly a proud part of Northern Ireland's heritage. That is no. Flip, oh, what's up? <laughs> Nothing, fine. I'm 
very nearly just crashed into a tree. That's fine. Just do not crash into the DeLorean. <laughs> Wait. Worst start ever. That's right. I'll bring it down. Hold on. Cool. Whoa. What, what the hell? What just happened? No, I just crashed. Shit. So, Graham, uh, what just happened? I was just an absolute idiot. I uh, just drove my drone into the side of my car. <laughs> Fortunately, the car is absolutely fine. I think it hit the tire, really, but I've shredded all my propellers. Fortunately, I bought spares, so the drone should be fine, but. You know when I said, don't crash it into the DeLorean? I didn't crash it into the DeLorean. But you were like, I've got to crash it into a different car. <laughs> I suck. Oh, that is so annoying. Right. Um, what else? Well. I think it might be time for a Guinness. Yeah. Well, we're going to... Okay, so now we're heading up north anyway. I mean, that's one way to finish the lovely DeLorean segment. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, that was literally the last shot of the whole thing. Well, finished. I was coming into land after all of that. Okay, so... On the, on the plus side, I think it might be roof down time. Yes. And actually, I want to do that because I want to talk about... Um, I don't think it's as good as everyone says it is. Con controversial, I know. Controversial, it I know. It is controversial. Right. Let me explain, though. Hold on. You see, scripture will have you believe that taking this down is so easy, you can do it one-handed while sitting at the traffic lights in 15 seconds while smoking a cigar with your other free hand. The fact of the matter is, though, at least to do it right, it's a fairly complicated affair, really. So you've got two clips, one on either side of the windshield. And then, if you don't want to crease your plastic rear winds window, which I imagine as an owner who loves their car wouldn't, you have to unzip the entire thing. Only then can you finally flip the roof back, which is oddly satisfying and quite easy, but it's not feather light as maybe the papers would have you believe. But let's go, M groan and mumble over. It's not a big deal. In many ways, it's really part of the NA's charm. And on a clear day, you likely won't be needing to touch your roof between the beginning of your trip and its end. When the skies are less predictable, however, you may just find yourself caught short and pressing through the rain because the ordeal of getting the roof back up just isn't worth the bother. A fact that we discovered firsthand as we left the outskirts of Belfast and travelled north to explore more of Northern Ireland. It is getting very, very wet. This is soggy, I can feel the top of my head. Windscreen wipers are on their second speed. Oh dear. There is a, a rainbow though. There is a rainbow. That means the sun is out and somewhere at the end of that rainbow, Graham, there's a pot of gold. <laughs> Did you know, you know the whole look of the Irish thing? Yeah. Actually it came from America because the, when the first Irish people emigrated over to America. Yeah. A lot of them took part in kind of the gold rush that happened there. And some of the fir first people to really like, do really well out of the gold rush because they found a load of gold were Irish people. Ah. So that's where luck of the Irish came from. There you go, all on the moment knowledge. Fortunately, on this occasion, opting to continue with the roof down through the rain was the correct decision, as we quickly found ourselves greeted with blue skies and a rather interesting piece of Northern Irish heritage called Tor Head. The building sat atop of Tor Head, operated as a Coast Guard station for around 100 years until it fell victim to a raid in 1920, during which a group of very well-mannered thieves, who after solemnly apologising for the inconvenience of it all, made off with the station's guns, ammunition, telescopes, binoculars, heliograph and telephone. And with all their lookouts, defence and communications kits stolen, the Coast Guard station proved a bit useless and therefore was abandoned not long after. And it has remained uninhabited for the century since. 
The sun was shining and we continued with our journey, once again opting to fold our MX-5's roof back and enjoy the open Irish air. This time, it was a mistake. Dry still, my head. It's a mind over matter. It's not mind over matter. <laughs> we need to face the facts and get the roof back on. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> roof coming over. <laughs> oh no. Hold on. <laughs> Okay, thank you. You got it. Oh, I'm so dripped on. <laughs> <laughs> Your phone is soaking. <laughs> I'm oh, soaking. My God. seat is soaking. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> my camera is soaking. Everything is soaking. <laughs> oh, look at that. That's literally sodden. To... Well, my, my pants in the bag. <laughs> you see that very porous looking wicker basket? The one sat on the boot of our MX-5, completely exposed to the rain? Well, that's where I decided to store all my clothes for the entire trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Graham is bringing in his basket with his clothes. Ah, oh, my wife fronts are soaking! Fortunately, the MX-5 has just enough space behind the rear seats to put a picnic basket. That is a really... It's not a picnic basket, it's a state-of-the-art clothing container. Right, I'm soaked. Excellent. Um, well, let's drive on for a little bit. Yeah. I think we should head on to the last stop of the day. I guess so, yeah. The rain wasn't enough to dampen our spirits. We still had one more sight to see, at the very north of Northern Ireland. Perhaps the country's most famous feature a natural wonder. The term natural wonder refers to a monument created by nature with no human involvement that evokes a feeling of amazement or wonder from those who see it. However, in my opinion, there is another kind of natural wonder. It's a monument so absurd, so odd to look at, you spend your time at the site not simply in mindless awe, but quietly and deeply wondering how on earth this piece of nature came to be. And the giant's causeway will certainly have you wondering. 40,000 columns of hexagonal rock, upright and bunched together, looking like a behemoth's pin art sculpture. Its name comes from an old Irish myth in which two giants, one from Ireland and one from Scotland, wanted to fight in order to see who is the more mighty. The problem, however, was that they had around 80 miles of cold, salty water between them. Therefore, Finn McCool, the Irish giant, built a causeway over the sea so that the giants could meet in the middle and slug it out. However, as Finn is adding the final touches to his mighty bridge, he catches a glimpse of the Scottish giant, Ben and Donna. He was massive, taller, broader and stronger than the already enormous Finn and the Irish giant quickly turns around and legs it back over his bridge to his home before the Scottish contender lays eyes upon his comparatively little opponent. Ben and Donna sees that the bridge is complete and begins to walk to the middle of the causeway, bellowing his opponent's name as he went. Meanwhile, the Irish Finn McCool had arrived home, puffing and panting and now knowing that should the battle commence, he would have no chance of victory and would end up sleeping with the fishes, so to speak. Fortunately for him, whilst his brawn wouldn't win him the fight, his wife's cunning brain could spare his life. She grabbed bunches of rags, each large enough to cover a car, and swaddled him as if he were a baby. She then popped him in a cradle, which must have been the size of a London bus, and tells him to pretend he's a baby. Ben and Donna, who had grown impatient waiting for his foe in the middle of the bridge, stomps up to the Irish coast, his booming voice challenging his rival giant. Finn's wife goes out to meet Ben and Donna and explains that her husband is a little late back from giant work or the giant pub or giant spin class or whatever. 
but that he's still very much keen for the fight and in fact asks whether Ben and Donna would be more comfortable waiting for him at their family home. Ben and Donna takes them up on this offer and walks with Steve to her and Finn's house. And when he walks through the front door, he suddenly stops in his tracks as laying in a cradle, he sees a baby, not quite as big as he, not as tall, not as broad, and undoubtedly not as strong, but nonetheless enormous. If this is the baby of Finn McCall, the Irish giant who fathered it must be a true behemoth, taller, broader, and stronger than any other creature on Earth. Ben and Donna tentatively steps back from the doorway, with excuses as to why he could no longer take part in the fight. He left his giant stove on back in Scotland. He pulled a giant hamstring on the walk over. He turns and legs it back over the causeway, taking care to pull apart and sink as much of the bridge as is necessary to ensure the giant of all giants, Finn McCool, cannot follow him back to Scotland. And that is the tale from which the giant's causeway got its name. The landmark's fascinating form comes from a lava flow that occurred around 50 to 60 million years ago. Because that lava flow happened right on the coast, it would regularly be splashed with cold seawater, which caused the lava to cool down extremely quickly. And put simply, this caused the solidifying lava to contract and crack as its temperature reduced, creating over a long time the columns we see today. The Giant's Causeway is teeming with tourists. Car parking is extortionate and I dare say it feels a tad overexploited for what is a 60 million year old completely natural occurrence. However, it is still well worth a visit for the stories, for the science, and to remind yourself just how weird our planet can be. Accommodation. Where should I go? In this front? Yeah, I think so. Thanks for watching episode one. Be sure to tune into episode two, where we attempt gravity racing in our Miata, encounter our first ever MX-5 breakdown, and share more excellent Irish stories. Thanks. Graham, what are you doing? Right. <laughs> in here are all my clothes for the whole trip, which have been on the back of the car, which has been rained on constantly all day long. Let's see how the wicker basket has protected my clothes. So this is like a YouTube unboxing. This is my video. yeah. This is our unboxing. We're unboxing my Y fronts. <laughs> right. No one wants to see this content. Oh, that's a bit damp, but that's okay. Oh no, my pajamas! <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're soaking. Or maybe they're just really cold. We, we've got a nice no, they're just wet. fire. Yeah. Warm them in front of the fire. I want a Guinness. Let's go for a Guinness. I want a Guinness.